Hi, I'm Desiree Chapel. Welcome to Top Med Talk. It's Tuesday and it's time for my round table. The round table is a chance to sit down with a multidisciplinary group to have discussion about perioperative care and improving the quality of what we do every day. Top Med Talk. And we are joined today by Dr. Philip Corvo. He is the chairman of surgery at St. Mary's in Waterburg, Connecticut. We also have Vicki Morton. She's the director of enhanced recovery at Providence Anesthesia in Charlotte. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Um, we've had thank you. some great discussions here at ACER over the last uh, day and a half. And um, obviously a lot of discussion around enhanced recovery. We've been talking about enhanced recovery for kind of non-cardiac, non-cardiac patients, non-critical patients, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about critical care patients and the critically ill. So I was wondering, um, you know, there's been some other discussions about doing some pretty, uh, pretty big surgeries and, and complicated procedures. And so is enhanced recovery something that we can use for that type of patient? Is it, or should we be doing it for everybody's healthy, you know, kind of the perfect patient. What, what is your experience with taking care of these, these types of patients? Sure. Well, Vicky? I mean, I think that um, the critically ill patient is, is still the ideal patient. Um, they will greatly benefit from the elements of enhanced recovery. Uh, we may, may not be able to do every single one of them. We may not be getting them out of bed the day of surgery and walking them. Um, we may be able to do that also. However, um, we just have to approach it in a, a little bit of a different manner than the, the normal healthy patient coming in for an elective surgery. Yeah. Dr. Cover, yeah. what is your experience with this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree completely. Um, and I think uh, some of the history is interesting here. You know, enhanced recovery really started out as enhanced recovery after surgery. And for literally over a decade now, that's the way people thought of it. And it's only until recently where people made the jump of enhancing the recovery of people who are sick but didn't have surgery in the first place. Um, so somebody that comes into the uh, intensive care unit, um, the, the, the principles of enhanced recovery are the same allow their body to compensate the way it has been designed to over millennia uh, and don't interfere with that, but figure out a way to enhance it. So yes, get them out of bed as soon as you you practically can. Um, Don't give them all the fluids that we used to give them uh, before. We would turn people into, you know, we would joke that we were making them the Michelin man. Um, And that's that's just wrong. Um, Keep things within a tight physiologic range that we were built to live in no matter how sick they are, and they, they do better. Yeah, absolutely. So this morning we've had a great discussion about uh, blood pressure and management of um, the surgical patient. And there was also some discussion from the crowd. We were talking about technology and how do we utilize technology. What are your feelings on, on monitoring, continuous monitoring, using technology, and, and does it have a place in enhanced recovery, I guess is a better question. I think that interoperatively, um, let me start there, elements like gold directed fluid therapy are of great benefit interop for the majority of surgeries. Um, postoperatively, I think that the for select surgeries, the larger surgeries, I think it's perfectly appropriate, um, especially if they're going to the ICU after surgery. I, I do wonder if these the surgeries that are going out to the floors, um, not as critically ill, if monitoring these patients potentially um, just may not work in those areas. But if they're going to the ICU and there is that level of care, um, that, that we should be monitoring them. You know, we do a great job interop of really keeping things tightly controlled. And then afterwards, they go maybe to the ICU and nothing is followed and it's it's undone somewhat. Yeah, yeah. We've had, we had that discussion this morning. Dr. Mm-hmm. Corvo, yeah. do you, what is your experience? In I agree. Um, and I like the way you said undone. Um, I think what happens now is we think we're monitoring people appropriately, but we're we're probably doing it wrong sometimes. Constant discussion in the ICU is, well, I have a blood pressure cuff on. I don't like the number the cuff is giving me, so I'm going to pay attention to the A-line yeah. because it's more expensive. Okay, but the A-line tracing is like, completely flat, so why are you paying attention to it? Yeah. Um, and the reality is, no matter how good your blood pressure cuff or your A-line is, you're measuring the pressure in somebody's arm, and we want to know their pressure in their kidneys and their liver, yeah. um, so you need something better. Um, I grew up in the time of swans. I really miss using a swan. I do think they were um, mischaracterized. Um, but if you have the ability, and, and we do, to see people's uh, intravascular fluid status and, again, keep them in that physiologic range where they're happy, that, that's what we need to do. I completely agree. <laughs> and we all know, I mean, even if we are getting a, a blood pressure, 
a blood pressure decline is our late indicator, right? So right. we already are behind the eight ball if we see hypotension. So we need to we need to use parameters that are a little bit more dynamic and give us more of a real time picture. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there's a, a lot of technology that's coming out there that's you know a lot less invasive than a swan that can give us mm-hmm. that. And, you know, one piece when you add that technology into practice, I just think the learning curve is so steep on it and people get so frustrated. Mm -hmm. One thing I think anytime we're talking about monitoring with or without newer technology is that what are people actually doing with the information that these monitors are collecting? You know, what what are your parameters? Do you have a protocol to follow? Is that something that you guys use, Dr. Uh, Corvo, in your practice? Do you have specific parameters and protocols that set up the expectation for if I'm having blood pressure issues, this is is what I do. I don't just automatically open the rollerball clamp and give them fluids or, right. you know what I mean? Yes. Um, we, we absolutely do have uh, flow charts for exactly that. And if this is the blood pressure and you don't like it, do these steps first. If they work, great. If they don't, then, you know, go into this pathway. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we have is when somebody comes uh, from, uh, from anywhere else in the hospital into the intensive care unit, the, the initial frenzy sets people up in a certain direction, and it's only after we've put three vasopressors on somebody that we whip out the monitor that we should have brought out, yes. you know, literally two days ago. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the challenge that we have. Yeah, for sure. Vicki, what is your experience? I know that you've done a lot of teaching and educating nurses for post-op care. And I'm not just talking for critically ill patients. I'm just, in general, what is your teaching? What are the teaching points? You know, I first start by teaching them the literature. I pull out the literature and say, this is what the evidence is telling us is the right thing to do. So this is not just me coming into the unit asking you to provide more care and to keep you busier. There's a, a method behind the madness. Um, so needing them to understand that literature and the evidence. <clears throat> and by, beyond that, giving them a protocol to follow but also being available because you introduce something like this that's new to them. Not all critical care nurses are used to dealing with things like stroke volume and cardiac index, perhaps in the CCU or the CVICU, but not necessarily in a medical surgical ICU. So <clears throat> making sure that they understand what it is that they're treating, why they're treating it, giving them a very defined protocol, what fluids, when, when they should document, what we're looking at, um, holding them accountable and always being available. Yeah, for sure. So how, Dr. Corver, you said you do have some protocols um, and pathways in place. What are you doing to monitor that people are actually utilizing that? Or do you, are you doing like process measures or are you, are you able to pull data to kind of see that? We're, we're able to pull the data. Um, the, the trick sometimes is actually getting people to enter the data in the first okay. place because you know, they're busy taking care of the patient. So the more automated the data collection is with whatever monitor device we're using, the better. Um, and now a lot of them just plug right into the monitors that we have in the bed. Um, if you have the right, um, I'm going to say software plugins, you can even have it automatically upload its information every 10 minutes or so right into your EMR, which is great. And once it's in the EMR, you can do anything you want with it. Yeah. Oh, one, one point when we talk about teaching the nurses, and one of the other guests we've had on the podcast, they were talking about providing uh, post uh, data about... A, a, a case that went really, really well, and they, they were on the ERS pathway and they had this great outcome, and they could look at all pieces of the chart. You know, everywhere there was, a, you know, they followed every piece of the pathway and every piece of the protocol. And then versus when the patient, and I hate using this phrase, but they, people understand it, falling mm-hmm. off the pathway, right? right. Yep. So they didn't fulfill the, the intended outcome. And putting those two next to one another. And I've done that in my own practice intraoperative, like, okay, this patient came out with, you know, pretty severe post-op hypotension, uh, post-op day one and two, we're still really struggling to catch up with that. What did our intra-op piece look like? And is that something that you've utilized in your practice? Maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Constant feedback is so important uh, with an enhanced recovery pathway, not just to help clinicians understand what's going well and maybe what's not going so well, but to make sure that they know the data, you know, they know how they're contributing to this. I think it's really important to go through those steps, albeit it may not be so comfortable sometimes because they, maybe clinicians feel like you're saying it was their fault. It's not, it's not punitive. It's a learning opportunity. And I try to remind them of that, but I think it is very important to not just look at what's, what's so great here, yeah. but what are we not doing so great and what do we need to fix? Yeah. We learn, learn from, learning from our experiences, right? Yes. Uh, you can imagine a lot of these cases um, end up getting presented like at M&M conferences. Um, and 
I, I think you tend to learn a lot more from the things that didn't go as well as they should have. So you come to a conference like this and people give you their case studies and you're like, wow, that was fantastic. The reality is they did it 50 other times and it wasn't so fantastic mm-hmm. and they're showing off when they give you their case exactly. studies. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but when you point out to your staff, here's where we went wrong, yeah. here's what we should have done instead, now you've helped the next patient. Yeah, absolutely. I would love for you to be able to come back, and there are plenty of other topics that we can discuss, I'm sure, all day long. But I appreciate you sitting down with us. I think it's been a great conversation. Top Head Talk. Nate Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.